good morning everyone it's my great pleasure to in uh, welcome you all who are joining us live here as well as online for the specialty update organized by Ceylon College of Physicians and this is our uh, special update for the mo month of February today we have the uh, Sri Lanka uh, members from Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine collaborating with us to make uh, this a great event and distribute the knowledge among our members. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Ganaka Senaratna, President of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, to be my co-chair. And I will invite him to introduce the speakers first. Thank you, sir. Uh, we warmly welcome all of you for this uh, specialty update. First speaker, we have uh, lined up uh, four speeches today. Out of them, first talk will be given by Prof. Uh, Pandu Karunanayaka. He's a professor of uh, professor in medicine and specialist uh, in internal medicine, attached to uh, Faculty of Medicine and uh, Teaching uh, National Hospital Sri Lanka. Um, uh, and he is a chairperson of the Humanities Society and Professionalism stream of the MBBS program. He's a director, Staff Development Center of University of Colombo. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ganaka, for that introduction, and good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, let me thank the, the Ceylon College of Physicians for uh, giving me a chance to speak to you today about this topic. So um, I thought I'll speak to you on um, uh, brucellosis. Uh, are we missing it? And uh, I also bring greetings from uh, my former trainer in the UK, Professor Nick Beeching, um, who is a brucellosis expert, actually. He was very pleased that uh, in the January issue of the uh, clinical medicine uh, of the Royal College of Physicians of London, um, uh, all the uh, tropical medicine CME uh, articles were written by uh, Sri Lankan uh, uh, authors, whom, who are all his good friends. And uh, that was, I think, uh, the, on the initiative of, initiative of Professor Arusha Disanayaka, who is our president of the college this year, who is also the, the leader of the, one of the international editors of the journal. So uh, with, with those greetings, um, basic, basically let me uh, introduce to you the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll first say a few words about the bacterium that causes brucellosis, then about the epidemiology, uh, a bit of a, about the clinical presentations, which I think is what you'd be most interested in, and then about the diagnosis, which I think is the single most important message I want to share with you today, number three and number four. Uh, and number five, I'll talk about the treatment just in basic outline because it's something that has to be individualized to each patient. And finally, I'll just um, ask this interesting question, are we missing it in Sri Lanka? So basically, the bacterium that causes brucellosis belong to the bacteria, belong to the species of brucella. These are gram-negative bacilli or very small bacilli, so therefore they are sometimes called cocoa bacilli. Uh, there are many species, um, uh, and uh, in our body, they can live as both uh, intracellular and extracellular parasites. Um, they can, in fact, actually invade our macrophages, get inside their lysosomes, and live inside the acidic environment of the lysosomes. Um, so they are called, they belong to that category of pathogens called stealth pathogens, which like get into the macrophages, into the lysosomes, and travel throughout the body using the macrophage as the vehicle. Um, so that's the important thing about brucellosis because that kind of still pathogen will invariably produce or will tend to produce uh, an infection which can relapse very easily. If you talk about the epidemiology, well, in nature, the infection is found in domesticated mammals, uh, such as cattle, sheep, and pigs. So it's very, very commonly seen in areas, rural areas, where there's a lot of, lot of animal farming. But actually, even outside that, it can be seen in other mammals also, even wild mammals also. Uh, it can live also in the environment once it is excreted, um, in, especially in cold, damp um, uh, matter, material, uh, which is especially if it is uh, um, full of uh, organic matter, and also sunlight kills it, so therefore if it is cold, damp, and dark in dark areas or non-sunlit areas, it can be, uh, stay for weeks or months in that sort of situation and then infect somebody afterwards, both directly and also through inhalation. So human beings are infected either directly, that will be basically animal handlers and people who work in farms, and also indirectly, 
um, through uh, inhalation of the aerosolized uh, bacteria from such material, plus also by uh, consuming raw or unpasteurized milk and milk products. So these are the ways that we become infected. Uh, <clears throat> the disease in animals is very important epidemiologically because uh, that is the, the natural reservoir of infection and we get it from the animals, so that's why it's called a zoonosis. So the veterinary sector in, is very important for a given country. They are the ones who actually are able to control even human disease because if, you can, if they can control the animal disease, the human side, you know, like uh, they, they escape. Uh, on the other hand, if the animal disease can be actually eradicated, as it has happened in some countries, uh, the humans will not get the disease. And I'm very happy to say that in Sri Lanka, our, our vet sector is very active on brucellosis. We, it appears that we got brucellosis somewhere in the 1970s when we imported uh, Indian cattle, uh, and that's how it came to the country. But our vet sector has been very active in, in uh, surveillance and vaccination and so on. So, so uh, you know, like from time to time, they find out that uh, it's very common in the animal sector in certain provinces, and they immediately take action to try to reduce that amount of infection in that particular province. So it, it varies from year to year, depending on surveillance and vaccination programs and so on. And the disease in farm animals is very important for us also because it's in, an important historical feature. You can ask your patients, uh, do you have access to farm animals? Do you work in farms? In your farms, has, has an animal died uh, or aborted and so on? So that's an important, you know, like a, um, a epidemiological question we can ask because that's that's often to find, is found to be the case in areas where it's endemic. And of course, uh, from animal uh, milk, uh, if you if we consume unpasteurized milk or milk dairy products, we can get it by ingestion through the GI tract. Now the clinical spectrum in uh, Human beings, there are three main presentations, although some textbooks actually say we should not try to divide them into uh, clinical presentations like this. I personally think, at least for the sake of understanding uh, and remembering, it might be easier to think of it as um, categories. So the three main categories are you can get an acute typhoid-like illness, or second, you can get a focal infection, that is fever plus a focal infection, like especially the musculoskeletal system or the genitourinary system, or the reticular enteral system. The most important, the most frequent is the musculoskeletal system. And the third presentation would be a chronic fever. And even before the bacterium was uh, discovered, it used to be called undulant fever, which basically means that the, the chronic fever is an intermittent periodic fever. So the patient has fever for, about, fever for about two weeks or so, and then the fever settles down, and they are okay for about a week, and then they get the fever again. So that's called an undulant fever. Uh, so that's the typical presentation, but of course it doesn't have to be always. So they are, they are the three main categories of clinical presentations, an acute typhoid-like illness, a fever with focal infection, and a chronic, undulant, chronic fever which might be undulant or periodic. So basically if you think of, an acute, of the acute illness, it's basically an acute or subacute onset, might have lymphadenopathy or organomegaly like liver and spleen enlargement, might mimic uh, glandular fever syndromes. So, uh, so basically, we, we have seen these sort of cases a lot in, in our own practice, and we would think of things like typhoid fever, IMN, uh, HIV, um, toxoplasmosis, CMV, and various other illnesses. So we, I think in that situation, brucellosis is also known to be a cause. The second one is fever with focal manifestations. If you take the musculoskeletal system, you might find a monoarthritis or a oligoarthritis or even a polyarthritis. It might affect the axial or the peripheral joints. The common joints which are affected are the knee, the hip, uh, the sacroiliac joints, especially unilateral sacroiliac joint involvement, lumbar spine, uh, sternoclavicular joint, which is a fairly special joint for infection, and the shoulder joint. And generally, uh, this joint involvement is not as destructive or suppurative as you would expect in other conditions. For example, in septic arthritis, you will expect a lot of pus formation and, uh, you know, like uh, soya sepsis and so on as, as well. But not, in, not so much in brucellosis, the destruction is much less. Uh, for example, in tuberculosis, it can be very destroying and uh, erosive, but uh, in brucellosis, it's not so much. It's a little bit more chronic and less destructive. Uh, the second uh, common system to be involved is the, the genitourinary system. In the male, they can get uh, orchitis with testicular pain or prostatitis. 
In the female, the, uh, anywhere it can be affected from the cervix to the, to the ovarian uh, ovaries. So they can get chronic uh, salpingo ophoritis, they can get tubo ovarian abscesses, they can just present a dyspnea and menorrhagia, and they can also get cervicitis. So the whole spectrum is possible. Even in the, fem in the, even in the male, I forgot to mention, they can also get uh, seminal vesicularitis, which is difficult to diagnose without a rectal examination. And uh, if you look at the involvement of the reticular endothelial system, they can get generalized lymphadenopathy, even visceral lymph nodes like, like mediastinal lymph nodes and so on, and liver and spleen enlargement. So it can happen in about 20% of the people, of the patients who get brucellosis. Other systems are affected very uncommonly, maybe there's maybe 2% or so, I mean less than 5% anyway. The nervous system, you can have meningitis, encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, uh, cranial nerve lesions, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and so on. In the CVS, we can have uh, endocarditis, including embolic phenomena and mycotic aneurysms, even in the brain. Uh, you can get myocarditis. Uh, very rarely, there can be lung involvement, nodule formation, abscesses, and so on, but that's pretty uncommon, maybe about 1%. So uh, those systems are very uncommon. The, the, the frequent ones are the musculoskeletal, the interurinary, and the reticular endothelial. So I thought I'd just share some photographs uh, of x-rays from the internet. Um, I don't know whether it's very clear, maybe. <coughs> you might see, this is a, a, a plain x-ray of a, a sacroiliitis on the left-hand side. You can see that the, towards the, the lower part of the joint, you can see the narrowing of the joint margin and the sclerosis and the erosions and the uneven joint margin. Uh, but of course, it's not very sensitive. The better test to do would be the MRI scan, which can clearly see the involvement, including bone marrow edema in the surrounding bones. Uh, that will be very clear cut. You can see it very easily over there. Uh, these are some photographs of um, spondylitis. You can see several uh, vertebral bodies in the lumbar spine being affected. You can see that they are, they are normally unifocal, but they can be multifocal. Uh, and they are not sort of... Uh, contiguous to the extent that you find it in tuberculosis. There may be non-contiguous involvement. Uh, and as I said earlier, they don't cause so much of destruction as you would expect in tuberculosis. Even if you find suppuration or pus formation, it won't be a big collection. And you probably won't find soya sepsis that much, although in this particular one in X-ray B, you can see that there is a soya sepsis. Uh, this is another one. This is, of course, uh, you can see a bit more contiguously involved, you know, like above, above and below the disc. And uh, that looks a bit more like tuberculosis. But as you know, in tuberculosis, the involvement is more thoracic than lumbar. Uh, and it also gives rise to uh, wedge collapse and also gibbous formation. These are unlikely in brucellosis, or uncommon in brucellosis. <clears throat> so the chronic variety, what, I, what, is, what was classically called undulant fever, that's when they get very prominent night sweats, even drenching, and anorexia and weight loss. So there are the three main manifestations of brucellosis. Let's talk about the diagnosis. Uh, I just want to want you to try and remember these three aspects. First is, uh, the first important point about diagnosis is, being, is to elicit a history of possible exposure to infection. So about 70% of people are animal handlers or people who have been exposed to farms or, animal, uh, or uh, farm animals, uh, either by handling them, such as um, abattoir workers or people who work with the animal, or even by just cleaning the things and dealing with the uh, organic matter and therefore getting the uh, inhalation of the aerosolized bacterium. So any exposure to animal farms, uh, animals, would be an important point to ask, and that's about 70% of patients. The second important point is to ask about milk consumption, whether you consume unpasteurized milk or dairy products, now, this doesn't have to be a rural person. It can be an urban person who went to the rural areas for a trip or something. It could even be an overseas exposure you know, in areas where you know that it's endemic, like the Mediterranean region and the Middle East. And you must very carefully ask about, because you know, some unspatcherized milk products are thought to be fashionable, like soft cheeses and so on. So, you know, like when you go to five-star hotels, you are served these things, and they will you know, like enjoy the soft cheese and get brucellosis a few months later. So that's the first point to ask, history of, a possible history of exposure to the infection. The second point to check is whether you have a compatible clinical picture, which I may describe to you. Is it a typhoid-like illness? Is it a focal infection or a chronic fever? 
uh, unfortunately, hematology, biochemistry, even histopathology, they are not useful in brucellosis diagnosis because they just either, they are either normal or slightly abnormal, doesn't say anything either way. But what is crucial is radiology because you can show, if, especially if the joints are involved or the GU tract is involved, you can find that there will be some abnormality. Even in the case of uh, organomegaly and lymphadenopathy, they'll be useful. So I think the most important form of investigation for brucellosis, apart from microbiology, would be radiology. So that's the second point. The third point is you have to liaise with the microbiology laboratory because you have to have laboratory confirmation to be certain that it's brucellosis, and that requires discussion with the microbiologist. So basically there are three tests that they can do. First is bacterial culture. You can take specimens like blood or bone marrow or joint fluid. Uh, it requires prolonged incubation and also special media, uh, to, uh, subculturing into, the, into special media. So that's why we, it's important to talk about the possibility of brucellosis with the microbiologist. Because uh, as you know, um, they, they can, um, the microbiology uh, laboratories cannot incubate a back blood culture or bone marrow culture forever. They normally incubate for about a week or two because of the high turnover required. But if you suspect brucellosis, they'll be very happy to keep it for even six weeks because they can grow much later. And also they have to do what are called blind subculturing into a special media after every week to try and grow it in the, those media as well. So that won't happen unless we, if we tell them, because you know, nobody can suspect brucellosis by looking at the blood specimen. So we have to share with them the information that there's an exposure to animals or unpasteurized milk. We must share with them that the clinical picture is compatible with brucellosis, and then they will do that. So that's very important. Second thing is PCR. That's much more useful than blood culture because it's more sensitive. But again, you must do it as early as possible before starting antibiotics and so on. So again, um, it's important to talk uh, with the laboratory. And the third test is serology. Uh, there are various antigen antibody tests which are available, but in Sri Lanka, we have the SAT or the standard agglutinin test, which can be used to diagnose either with a single high theta or a fourfold rising theta. Now, the important point is all these three tests are available in Sri Lanka at the Medical Research Institute. Uh, so speak to your hospital microbiologist or, or to the Department of Bacteriology at the MRI, discuss with them that you are suspecting brucellosis, and then they can make those arrangements. And always consider tuberculosis as well, because that can also mimic brucellosis, although there are subtle differences. Uh, I'll just outline treatment. Uh, basically, you need prolonged antibiotic therapies because of the need to prevent relapses. So there are, yeah, you, and you need longer courses for more complicated diseases, especially with suppuration. Um, some in vitro effective antibiotic classes actually may not be effective in vivo, for example, beta-lactams and fluoroquinolone, so we don't use them. Uh, and the antibiotics which are used against tuberculosis, such as streptomycin or rifampicin, are used here, but they should not be used alone. So I'll just give an example of a regimen, just as an example. Uh, we may start off with three antibiotics. For the first two weeks, we'll probably give an amyl glycoside, such as streptomycin or gentamicin, for two weeks and then continue maybe the other two orally, rifampicin and doxycycline for about six weeks. And then it's important to follow up the patient for up to two years because they can have a relapse. So it's basically the treatment outcome, but that's very variable. That has to be uh, individualized to, the, to each patient. Right, my final question is, are we missing it in Sri Lanka? Now, in Sri Lanka, uh, brucellosis is widely prevalent in animals. Um, I told you that it was imported probably from Indian cattle in the 1970s, so it's, been, it's still there in a, in a big way. And the, uh, basically, uh, the, the veterinary surgeons uh, do, do a very good job throughout the country of uh, maintaining surveillance and doing vaccinations and trying to and cull the animals who are infected and try to keep it as low as possible. So nevertheless, it is present. Uh, and uh, we did a study a, a few years ago to look for uh, the zero surveillance of antibody formation to Brucella among healthy people living in those areas. We did it in four provinces, and we found that there about seven or eight percent of people were actually positive for antibodies, which is a very specific antibody. And the important point is there were clear-cut uh, uh, association statistically with people who are animal handlers or exposed to farm environment. So it looks like our people who are working in those rural areas do actually get asymptomatic infection. That's why they got the antibodies. And Indian studies have also shown that Raw milk consumption is a very high possibility risk factor for uh, brucellosis. Uh, and also we see it occasionally in, in, in returning travelers as well. So my important question is, are we missing it in Sri Lanka? Because first of all, we don't ask the epidemiological question. 
And secondly, we are not quite, quite aware of the clinical presentations. And thirdly, because we don't speak to the microbiology laboratory. If we keep those three things in mind, I think we, we might be picking up Brusilla cases. To be honest, I mean, we actually did pick up a case a few um, uh, months ago in a profinet, and we, it's actually in press now, the case report. So uh, we believe that uh, you know, it is present and we are missing it. So my take home message for you is basically, remember the epidemiological history, animal handlers, farm exposure, unpasteurized reproduct consumption, overseas travel. Remember the comparable clinical pictures, the acute febrile illness, which is like typhoid, the acute fever with focal infection, and the chronic undulant fever. And remember to speak to the microbiologist, because we have to send the right specimen at the right time, and they have to be aware of the fact that we are suspecting it so that they can do the right test for them. Thank you. Thank you, Panduka. Uh, it's an excellent presentation, presenting it in a very simple way. Uh, it's open for questions. Uh, uh, people who are on uh, virtual can type it in the Q&A box and we'll get the answers to that. We already have two questions, Panduka. What was the clinical status of people who had positive antibodies? They were symptomatic. I think you are talking about my, our CMJ paper. Hmm. They were all healthy people. Right, so yeah. antibody positive does not mean that they, either they had the disease or is it a... Asymptomatic infection. infection. Yeah, so I mean in, a, in any infection we have infection, disease and complications. So these are people who are exposed and infected but not, never had the disease. Right. So about 8% 8, 8 had the infection. Right, thank you. And another question I think we have already answered. Has any screening process done among cattle? I think it's... Oh yes, said yes, the they do it People are doing it in our country as well. Yes, yes, they do it all the time. Drug regime and duration of treatment, again, I think you have... Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a little complicated. It has to be individualized. So I just, generally speaking, six weeks of oral therapy combined would be a very good idea to prevent relapse, something like doxy plus rifampicin. Maybe the first two weeks you might also want to combine with the aminoglycoside. That will uh, increase the symptomatic re uh, improvement uh, very rapidly. So that's basically the structure, but you know, like if there's suppuration, you will have to do more things like surgery, you may have to prolong the infection. If it's CNS infection, it has to be different regimens. So I, I mean, I don't want to go into details of that. I would probably have to, we'll have to just look at the case and decide what to do. It's very individualized, okay. but the rough, rough picture is that. Thank you, Panduka. Any questions from the live audience here? One more question. Is there any specific pathognomic features clinically? I don't think that you um, I, Probably not, but if I see someone with fever and uh, unilateral sacroiliitis, I, I, I would say it's brucellosis until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. The only other real DD is tuberculosis, isn't it? But, uh, yeah. Yeah, probably TB may be more common in, more common in Sri Lanka. Our, our experience, yeah. uh, but yeah. probably we'll be missing because diagnosis is difficult with that brucellosis yeah. probably. Uh, other question comes to my mind is, is it always, I would say, when say focal, like musculoskeletal, is it always with fever that we are a suspect? If you don't have a fever, which we don't have a proper diagnosis of, say, uh, say cryliitis, still it's possible or? Uh, well, I mean, Manson's has a nice table which describes the, the symptoms. Fever is present in about 95 to 100, nine, uh, over 95 percent of people. So I would imagine you'll expect them to be febrile. Any questions, Kanaka? Uh, cause uh, meningitic type of syndrome as well? Yeah, I guess uh, maybe one percent or around that level, meaning meningoencephalitis, the CSF shows high protein, normal or low sugar lymphocytes. So it's like a chronic meningitis can be, you, you might think of TB, fungal, uh, and you might find focal lesions, what, you, what sometimes they are called neurobrucellosis. You might find cranial nerve lesions, GBS, and so on. But these are really uncommon, but they can happen. Thank you, sir. Another question just come up. Uh, can we differentiate TB from brucellosis on bone involvement itself? Uh, radiologists are fairly confident uh, because of the temper of the illness and the degree mm. of destruction. Even they've combined them together, it, it looks a bit, little bit more benign than tuberculosis in terms of both destruction, deformity, and uh, complications mm. like suppuration. Uh, but you have to go for microbiology to confirm it. And the point is probably because it's chronic, by that time blood culture won't be very useful, so you are stuck with the antibody and the PCR. Um, so that's why it's very important to speak to the laboratory to organize that. Even in our case report, we did that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it does have its pointers. Radiologists are very confident when they see this. 
MRIs. The PCR is from the site of the problem or is it blood? Any material, blood, we did with the blood but it was negative, we got it from the antibodies but you can use blood or any specimens. Okay, uh, question. zero prevalence indication of treat for treatment? Um, sorry? If there is zero positive IV without symptom, like asymptomatic infection, do we need to treat? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there is something called asymptomatic brucellosis. Uh, I, I would probably not rush in to treat really. I mean, even in our uh, zero surveillance study, about 80% were actually antibody positive. Uh, of course, we did not treat any of them. They were completely asymptomatic. I don't think that we need to treat them, but uh, uh, provided if they, are, if they are symptomatic, then we have to evaluate clinically to decide whether to treat or not. Uh, but if they are completely asymptomatic and picked up accidentally like in a research project, I don't think we need to treat them. Okay, Panduga, thank you very much okay. for your time and very, very pleasant uh, presentation. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much on thank behalf you. of the college. Over to Glenn. Um, Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to the second talk of the day that will be on amoebic liver abscess and overview. I would like to invite uh, Prof. Uh, Professor T. Kumanan. He's a professor in uh, medicine and specialist in internal medicine from uh, Jaffna University. Uh, Kumanan is an ordinary consultant physician and, uh, in teaching hospital Jaffna and he's a adjunct senior lecturer, James Cook University, Queensland, Australia. Is a member of the Research and Scholarship Committee of Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna. So over to you, Kumanan. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you, Ganaka, for that introduction. And uh, thanks for providing this opportunity for update on a very interesting uh, clinical scenario. Uh, it's highly prevalent in uh, northern Sri Lanka, but it is not uncommon in any other part of the world. I would like to start off with a clinical scenario. This is a 47-year-old farmer presented with a fever, constitutional symptoms, and upper abdominal pain of one week duration. He's a smoker, and regularly consumes Palmyra toddy, a popular drink of Northern Sri Lanka, a local palm wine. On examination, he was febrile and vitals were stable. Tenderness over the epigastrium was noted. Initial investigations revealed a neutrophil leukocytosis, a high ESR, CRP, and a normal chest X-ray and a urine routine. So what is the most probable clinical diagnosis? Any, any clinician will come out with uh, these uh, differential diagnoses, acute pancreatitis, acute cholecystitis, liver abscess, any pyogenic abdominal foci. However, uh, Physician from northern Sri Lanka has always put amoebic liver abscess in the top because it is so common in that part of the world. And uh, the reason why is uh, the patient is a regular toddy drinker. That makes us to think that it is the amoebic liver abscess. So uh, it was there when we were medical students, uh, we observed a lot of cases in Jaffna with amoebic liver abscess. When I assumed uh, academic position, then I thought of uh, analyzing these and confirming are we, are we really getting uh, amoebic liver abscess or something else. So we designed a study in 2012 to 2015 and associated with uh, Colombo North uh, Medical College and the International Diarrheal Center. And we could able to um, identify nearly 346 cases in three years and confirmed it with ELISA. And uh, we published the first epidemiological report in um, BMC Public Health. And the two interesting things we noted was uh, it is seven to 10 times more common among adult men, most frequently in the fourth and fifth decades. And almost all patients were regular consumers of Palmyra toddy. And incidence of amoebic liver abscess increases with the climate-based toddy sales. So you can see that uh, the rainfall in Jaffna is minimum in June, July. The toddy sales hit maximum, and the amoebic liver abscess also the maximum. So naturally the question arises, why there is a predilection for adult males, and is the association with Palmyra toddy is really a causal or casual link? So again, we analyzed the literature and we could able to write a review on the Journal of Tropical Medicine, amoebic liver abscess and indigenous alcohol beverages in the tropics. And we found um, a lot of animal studies 
and human studies uh, pointing uh, why the gender difference and the age difference occurs. A study pointed out 75% uh, of the male mice developed abscesses. None of the female mice did when they inoculated with uh, amoeba in the blood. So that's clearly pointed out that female gender is more prone to, uh, is fairly protected from amoeba glioreps than males. The explanation they give is the menstrual cycle prevents hepatic congestion and decreases susceptibility to amoebic invasion is one theory, or decreased iron stores and estrogenic hormones in females are possible factors limiting amoebic invasion, and testosterone increases susceptibility of mice to ALA by reducing the interferon gamma secretion by the natural killer cells. So those are the mechanisms proposed in most of the studies. So we did a small study on the next uh, season, toddy season. We found around 35 patients in our own ward. And we did the testosterone levels. And again, surprisingly, I found that the testosterone levels were very high among those males uh, age 40 to 50 years than the younger group and the uh, elder group. And similarly, another second peak at 70 to 80. So it's, uh, anyway, it's a small number, but I can't uh, exactly say this is the mechanism, but there is an interesting uh, uh, finding. And uh, amoebic liver abscess in the immunity of the host is the another important factor. Why only some patients with intestinal amoebiasis develop ALA may be influenced by the host immunity. Patients with HIV develop extensive amoebic liver abscess, confirming the role of the cell-mediated immunity. And animal studies show that immune suppression following thymectomy or splenectomy leads to increased incidence of amoebic liver abscess. So the host immune system is also plays an important role. So is the relationship between palmyra toddy and amoebic liver abscess is it really a casual, or is really toddy causing the amoebic liver abscess? It's an unanswered question. So if you take um, uh, the casual link, if I will consider first, a low socioeconomic and nutritional status favors amoebic liver abscess, and toddy drinking is common in this population, the low social class. And poor sanitation and hygienic practices in and around toddy taverns observed in Jaffna. Taverns have no latrine facilities, and most amoebic liver abscess patients refer to open air defecation. Almost everyone said they have defecated behind the taverns where there's no latrine facilities. And unhygienic utensils used to store and drink toddy because there's no water available in the taverns. So they keep just uh, used utensils there and use it the next day. So enough cockroaches, uh, rats, uh, and um, ants are there. Lack of clean water for drinking as well as washing utensils is noted. So this is a typical toddy tavern of an island from northern Sri Lanka. There's a social harmony. You can see there's no race. No religion, no caste, no age, nothing. It's a real a place of social harmony. So the third thing we thought it's a casual because difficulty in demonstrating the presence of amoeba in the toddy. Actually, we sedimented uh, 25 samples of toddy from the popular taverns that we got patients. And we tried to do PCR on that, cultures on that. But we couldn't find any single amoeba from those toddy samples. So that raises the possibility, why, why these people are getting amoebic liver abscess? What are the mechanisms? And then Palmyra toddy and the ALA will come to the causal link. So toddy is a good culture medium for entamoeba histolytica. The components are exactly matching the Robinson media that cultures the amoeba. So presence of disaccharides, large yeast cells, mildly acidic pH, and favorable medium. So it's, uh, it's a really a favorable medium to grow amoeba. And alcohol and iron have a synergistic effect on the pathogenesis of amoebic liver abscess. Alcohol consumption increases the hepatic iron stores. Alcohol downregulates the hepcidin expression, a key hormone in iron metabolism. Palmyra toddy provides additional iron load. And presence of iron promotes the growth of amoeba in vitro as well. So again, the same sample, I did the transference saturation, full iron studies among the patients. Again, the age 40 to 54, I found the transference saturation is the maximum. So again, there's a possibility that iron stores are high in our patients. And this is, uh, there's no data to um, analyze the toddy components, but somebody has analyzed the components of Palmyra jaggery. That's very popular from Jaffna that contains 11 milligram of iron per 100 grams, 
uh, copper content also uh, it contains a lot of calcium phosphorus and all no wonder that when we were children we were receiving uh, toddy as a uh, drink for mums uh, measles uh, chicken pox even i had a uh, toddy fresh toddy as a treatment for the um, treatment for mums so it, it's a definitely a nutritional drink but i am not propagating jaffna toddy is not the right me forum to propagate so alcohol favors amoebic liver abscess by inducing pure poor nutritional status hepatic dysfunction and suppression of amniotic immune mechanisms alcohol also directly facilitates amoeba invasions induces hyperpermeability and dysbiosis of intestinal organism facilitating the invasiveness so at, at the moment we are trying to do a study on uh, their intestinal uh, um, bacterial content to see whether really toddy induces uh, intestinal dysbiosis that facilitate the entry of amoeba additional factors of liver that influence amoebic liver abscess a small number of amoeba only found relative to the size of the abscess we, we couldn't even get a, a positive microscopical sample from the culture entomia histotica can kill hepatocytes effectively with extensive tissue destruction fatty liver provides nutrients to amoeba and helps in proliferation and we didn't have a single patient with cirrhotic liver and amoebic liver abscess so cirrhotic liver is protective for amoeba amoebic liver abscess but the fatty liver is the opposite and cirrhotic liver will not provide a space and nutrients for amoeba so there are pathogenic factors of the amoeba also very important in inducing this uh, liver abscesses there are three pathogenic factors were recommended uh, recognized the gal galnac adhesion molecules these are mediating adherence to host cells the amoeba pores small peptides that produce pores on target membranes and cysteine proteinases helps tissue invasion evasion of host defense and parasitic induction of inflammation so there are virulent factors related to the organism as well so if you take the clinical presentation of amoebic liver abscess the hepatic illness could occur from a few days to several years sometime as long as 10 to 15 years after an intestinal infection this is first uh, reported by professor rajasurya and dr nagaratnam in uh, journal of tropical medicine and hygiene 1962 few years later uh, dr ramachandran has done a lot of studies on amoebiasis in, in sri lankan context and he said a study done few years later found that 57% of the cases of amoebic liver abscess observed during episodes of acute dysentery so there is again a controversy and later a few indian studies that published last year saying that uh, synergistic um, uh, or same time they are having a intestinal infection also more than 50% so again it depend on the amoebic strain rather than the uh, other factors So, what are the common symptoms of uh, amoebic liver abscess? Prolonged febrile illness. Usually, they present on the second week of the febrile illness. Pain, epigastric pain, right chest pain, shoulder pain, dull, uh, maybe pleuritic and aching, cough, sweating, malaise, weight loss, anorexia, and hiccough are the other symptoms. Hepatomegaly and point tenderness or intercostal tenderness are the two important signs. the complications a variety of complications occur we had our own complications in jaffna rupture of liver abscess can occur in into any adjoining space or organ extension into the chest occurs almost four times as often as extension into the peritoneal cavity and up to 7% of cases the abscess ruptures into the peritoneum causing peritonitis so again we had a very surprising case of a right iliac fossa mass i thought it was a appendix mass or something a crohn's disease but ultimately scan found we had amoebic liver abscess tracking into the right iliac fossa so anywhere in the peritoneum you can get a focus of collection and this extra was taken uh, i think 7 uh, or 8 years back before we had a confirmation test for amoeba patient presented to the emergency and died of a pyoneuma pericardium and uh, we cultured a gram negative organism from the pericardial fluid at that time we couldn't uh, have kids to confirm but most probably uh, amoebic liver abscess ruptured into the pericardium is the most possible cause and very recently uh, the surgical team have uh, uh, had a very bad amoebic uh, colitis 
uh, necrotizing, fulminant necrotizing amoebic colitis, and the patient underwent a colonic resection. Hepatic vein and inferior vena cava thrombosis secondary to amoebic liver abscess is another recognized complication. Chronic presentations with months of fever, weight loss, and abdominal pain with or without hepatomegaly often mimics tuberculosis. So that's a very common scenario we encounter. A cachectic patients usually admitted with fever of one or two months duration, and the ultrasound shows that's a single solitary liver abscess causing that uh, negative nitrogen balance. So this is the amoebic liver abscess with the IVC thrombus. Got from the uh, internet, I have got it. And uh, the investigations, right, the supporting investigations are um, full blood count always. Uh, neutrophil leukocytosis is very common, high ESR, high CRP. Liver function test, usually normal, except a mild elevation of alkaline phosphatase if the abscess is closer to the common bile duct. Hepatic transaminases may also be elevated, but not very high. It's around 70, 80 in the range. Abnormal chest radiograph, actually before the ultrasonic era, uh, Dr. Ramachandran has proposed a score based on the chest X-ray, whether to aspirate or not, this patient. The elevation of diaphragm, hemidiaphragm, point tenderness, and uh, right shoulder deep pain, and he has given various scores. And based on the score, he recommended to try for aspiration on the point of tenderness. So they have struggled a lot uh, in the history, but uh, ultrasound is a very easy uh, investigation. Even a house officer can pick up the amoebic liver abscess at the moment. Abnormal radiograph is a feature, and solitary right lobe abscesses are common in ultrasound scan. And uh, in our own study, we analyzed the symptoms. Again, it's compatible with the uh, international studies. The clinical findings are right hypochondrial pain 100%, and uh, abdominal pain, 46%. Uh, and um, the same findings, they say, ESR is elevated in 85%, ALT is not elevated, AST, alkaline phosphate is in 72%. So that, that's incompatible with the other studies. The diagnostic tests are three, serologic or antigenic testing in the blood, microscopy or antigenic testing of the stool, and evaluation for the parasite in the liver abscess fluid. And uh, imaging, cystic intrahepatic um, cavity appears as a round, well-defined hypoechoic mass in the ultrasound scan found in the posterior part of the right lobe. Um, why right lobe is affected is uh, because of this anatomy. The portal vein drains most of the blood into the right lobe first. So that's why the amoeba get trapped into the right lobe. So 70 to 80% are solitary subcapsular lesions close to the surface. And localization in the left lobe predisposes to extension of the pericardial sac. It's a dangerous sign of left lobe abscess if it's too large and patient has to undergo aspiration immediately. And CT scan, we, not, we, we are not uh, doing CT scans because ultrasonography is almost confirmative, but appears as a low density mass with a peripheral enhancing rim. MRI T2 weighted scans will show hyperintensity lesions. Technician scans uh, differentiate amoebic liver abscess from uh, pyogenic liver abscess because uh, amoebic liver abscess are cold lesions except uh, a periphery, you get an uh, active area, a rim of area, and the center is cold, but pyogenic liver abscess appears as hot lesions. Uh, radiological sequelae, that is important, uh, uh, important aspects because most of the past uh, patients with uh, post-amoebic uh, um, liver abscess patient, the amoebic liver abscess, the cavity will persist for two years. So after healing, the periphery of the abscess may calcify as a thin, round ring, and lesions may appear to increase in size even after aspiration for the next few weeks, and then regress in size but it persists for two years, so you don't have to jump and treat. You have to, based on the blood investigations only, we treat uh, patients with amoebic liver abscess. Complete radiological resolution occurs after two years only. Approximately 99% of the patients with amoebic liver abscess developed uh, detectable antibodies. Serological testing may be negative in the first seven days and detectable and 90 to 97% at presentation. It is after a week, usually. In the endemic areas, up to 35% of the uninfected individuals have anti-amoebic antibodies. That indicates it's a highly prevalent disease in certain communities. A negative serology is helpful for exclusion of disease. 
but positive serology cannot distinguish between acute and previous infection. Antigen testing uh, for PCR we used to do. Usually we does from the material obtained from the pulse. Also you can do it from the blood. Various commercial kits are available. Treatment-wise, empirically we treat patients with amoebic liver abscess with uh, antibiotics. Treatment of amoebic liver abscess consists of a tissue agent and a luminal agent. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, at the moment, we don't have a luminal agent in the government sector. Few private sectors had uh, few drugs. I will come to it in a while. In uncomplicated ALA, medical therapy is enough. So what are the indications for uh, aspiration of abscess? Imminent risk of rupture, that's a surface abscess, or so abscess more than 8 cm in size. Clinical deterioration, lack of response to empiric therapy, and exclusion of alternative diagnosis. Those are the common indications for aspiration. Uh, metronidazole still stands still as the first agent. It's 400 to 800 milligram three times a day. Oral tablets is enough if you treat for 7 to 10 days. The cure rate is more than 90%. Metron metronidazole is well absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract and no added advantage with intravenous therapy noted as long as the patient can take oral medications because uh, the antronidazole is absorbed and straight away carried by the portal tract to the site of uh, liver abscess. So it's always oral agents are preferable than the parental agents. And several studies have pointed that uh, still metronidazole is the drug of choice. The, um, the resistance is extremely rare. Uh, considering that uh, we were able to write a review that metronidazole for MEBS is a tail more than half a century. It's a drug that is still uh, very, this drug of choice for more than 50 years for MEBS is. And uh, should be given in all, luminal agents should be given in all patients with amoebic liver abscess to eradicate the cyst. And the recommended regimes are paramomycin, uh, diiodohydroxyquin, and diloxinate furate. Diloxinate furate was available in Sri Lanka a few years back. And prognosis, uncomplicated amoebic liver abscess has a mortality rate of less than 1% if diagnosed and treated early. And overall mortality rate of 17% was noted in an Indian study. I think our prognosis is much better. We didn't have a, one or two deaths uh, ruptured into the pericardium and another one or two patients. So our success rate of treatment is much better. And independent risk factors for increased mortality are bilirubin levels, serum albumin low, and the large volume of abscess cavity, multiple abscess, and encephalopathy. Those are all poor uh, prognostic markers. Considering that uh, load of patients and morbidity and uh, the health cost, uh, uh, we were able to write a comment in Lancet, Infectious Disease in 2020, uh, pointing out our cases, number of cases. And the future studies are expected in related to entomy by including regulation of gene expression, cell biology and signaling, pathogenesis, and microbiome to be explored in detail, understanding host immune response for the development of vaccines, and to open up a new treatment avenues, an association of ALA with male gender, influence of locally brewed alcohol beverages on ALA to be studied in detail. Thank you. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Conan. Thank you. Uh, we will proceed with the questions. We have a few from the virtual audience. The prevalence of asymptomatic intestinal, intestinal infections among general population, does it require screening and treatment? Are there asymptomatic intestinal infections? No. 90% of the intestinal amoebias are asymptomatic and uh, most of the uh, say deprived communities in Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka will have a very high prevalence of intestinal amoebias is asymptomatic and that doesn't need treatment. Screen for them. There's no point in screening. No, no point them. in screening. Thank you. And what are possible causes for such predominant in male preponderance in amoebic liver abscess? Other yeah. than the toddy. Yeah, that, um, uh, uh, that I proposed that mechanisms. One mm. is testosterone and the number of the iron status of the patient. And um, alcohol also consumption is more common among males than females. So the testosterone and the estrogen hormone disparity and the alcohol use, those are the two common. Uh, 
uh, again, yeah, question from Dr. Raghunathan. Those days teaching was dose of metronidazole for MBB colitis is 800 milligram TDS and hepatic amoebiasis is 400 milligram TDS. Is it the dose still? Yes, yes. As I said that uh, because we need uh, oral doses, uh, 400 milligram is enough because the liver is the site where the antibiotic is taken up to the body first. So it accumulates in high concentration in the liver. Okay. So obviously the, we need a lower dose in liver than the intestine. Because the intestine we go to the systemic circulation and come first to the time. site. So, okay. oh. right. so that explains the difference. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any, uh, any explanation why amoeba could not be cultured in toddy sample? Very difficult. That's a good question. Um, still we are not sure our toddy is uh, having amoeba or not. because. Uh, Culturing amoeba is not very easy, and we stand, uh, use the standard Robinson medium, but several studies have pointed out we have to do a very uh, advanced uh, technologies to use the cultures of uh, amoeba. So still, uh, I'm not sure that we are missing patients, uh, toddy samples with amoeba. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kumaran, it's an excellent talk. Uh, I have a few questions. One is, um, now, clearly, this amoebic liver abscess you don't see everywhere. I mean, it's clearly confined to high-risk areas. And as you say, it's clearly associated with toddy, uh, you know, taverns and use of toddy in that environment. So um, have, have you looked into uh, kind of screening uh, these people who are consuming toddy? I, I'm not sure, uh, apart from this uh, stool analysis, anything like a serological study where you can look at the amoeba, you know, antibodies, something like that, and then looking at something like a prophylactic treatment yes. to eradicate amoeba in these populations in order to prevent them from getting amoebic liver abscess. That is one question. The other one is, uh, uh, have you looked at simple health, public health interventions in these areas in order to prevent because amoeba has to still enter the body from yes. somewhere. So whether that has any impact on reducing amoebic liver abscess. Both the questions are very good. We are attending both because no point in treating amoeba 300, 400 in the hospital and waiting for the community to get amoeba. So we did a study around the, all those 300 patients. We have got stool samples and we tested for PCR as well as uh, amoeba OVA cyst. But none of them had excreted uh, amoeba. So that, that's a very interesting uh, findings. So there's no synchronous colitis there. So they had uh, amoeba, but they don't excrete amoeba in the stools, but they invaded in the liver. So it is almost always worth uh, screening those population high risk and administering luminal agents, because uh, certainly amoeba is there, but we are not getting outside. And number two, the taverns, we have got a project and we are appointed at a committee look into the taverns, uh, that, uh, their cleanliness, and at least one or two latrines to build in each taverns, and without um, opening a taverns without a latrine facility. So we are looking in both areas as well. So uh, really we are attending on that. Thank you, Aranga. Uh, Anaka, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, uh, for that excellent presentation with sharing your data from your patients. and. Thank you for making it an enriched presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are moving to the third lecture of the specialty update on tropical medicine. It's my great pleasure to invite Prof, uh, Professor Iranga Sanjeev Vijayavikrama, who is a professor and a specialist in nephrology, for his talk on uh, acute kidney injury in snake envenoming. And uh, Prof. Uh, Vijay Vikrama, uh, his, his research interest includes venom induced acute kidney injury and thrombotic microangiopathy and chronic kidney disease in Sri Lanka. What do you, Prof. Vijay Vikrama? Uh, thank you, Duminda, for those uh, kind words of introduction. So, first of all, I would like to thank the CCP for. Uh, Remove my mask. Yeah. First, I would like to thank CCP for inviting me and also to recognize snake bites as a tropical disease because it is a tropical 
uh, disease symposium. So, um, so, um, uh, so our, my talk would be mainly focusing on these aspects, epidemiology of snake bites, snakes causing AKI in Sri Lanka, then pathophysiology of AKI in snake bites and prevention and management of AKI. So, um, so when you, before moving on to the AKI component, I would just, just like to introduce uh, snake bites and uh, look into more into the epidemiology of snake bites. And um, uh, around 5.4 million snake bites occur around the world. And um, around 100,000 people die each year as a result of snake bites. And um, quite a large number of them, a uh, large number of individuals uh, end up disabled and disfigured because of snake bites. And therefore, uh, snake bites has been recognized by WHO as a neglected tropical disease in 2017. It was previously also recognized, but subsequently removed, and then again recognized in 2017. So it is truly a tropical disease because snakes are ectothermic animals, and they live in um, tropical environments. And as you see, if you look at the uh, regions of the world with highest number of snake bites, they are all in the tropics, South and Central America, Africa, and South Asia and the Southeast Asia. So if you look at Sri Lanka, uh, around 80,000 snake bites occur per each year, uh, uh, which, lead, uh, which lead to 30,000 envenomings, because some of them are dry bites, so you don't have envenomings, and 400 people die each year due to snake bites. And uh, if you look at the medical important snakes in Sri Lanka, uh, the categorization of snakes have changed over the years. And when we were students, we looked at uh, snakes, uh, venomous snakes in Sri Lanka as highly venomous, moderately venomous, and non-venomous. But now the classification was subsequently changed, and we now say highly venomous, potentially highly venomous, and venomous. These are the medically important uh, how we categorize the snakes, and why, how we say highly venomous if they are possibly life-threatening uh, with reported deaths. And we have a few snakes in that category in Sri Lanka. We have the cobra, the common crate, Sri Lankan crate, Russell's viper, and uh, two species of hump-nosed viper uh, uh, coming into that category. So they are life-threatening uh, with reported deaths. Then there are potentially highly venomous snakes, which are uh, snakes which has which are venomous but can lead to deaths, but still no reported deaths in Sri Lanka. So these are the uh, so scaled viper, and uh, another one species of Hypnale uh, Hypnale uh, nepa, the hump nose one type of hump nose viper, and then the green pit viper. Then there are some types of venomous snakes which, uh, which are clearly not life-threatening, like the Sri Lankan keelback. So, uh, World Health Organization also categorized snakes according to the medical importance, and, and they have two categories, WHO Category 1 and Category 2. Category 1 is where they categorize uh, snakes of highest medical importance, and these are the uh, snakes, apart from their venomous nature, their impact, depending on uh, how widespread they are, how numerous their bites are in relation to human populations, and how much morbidity, mortality, and disability they cause. And based on this classification, four snakes of Sri Lanka are categorized as WHO Category 1 snakes. These are the Cobra, Russell's Viper, Common Crate, and the uh, Hypnale Hypnale species of Hump Nose Pit Viper. So these are considered as Category 1, so high impactful snakes uh, in Sri Lanka. So therefore, they are considered as the big four in Sri Lanka, big four snakes, the co cobra, the common crate, the Russell's viper, and the hypnale hypnale species of hump-nosed viper. So um, moving on to the AKI. So out of these snakes, three species are associated with AKI. Um, Russell's viper, is by far the most potent uh, venomous snake causing AKI with about around 10 to 40 percent of um, bites leading to uh, AKI. And then you have the 
hump nose pit viper causing uh, AKI in around 1 to 10 percent of uh, bitten individuals. Then you have this uh, so scale viper in Sri Lanka, which, which is mainly um, in the northern parts of the country where Kumanan is coming from. And, uh, and, and, and strangely, uh, this snake has not been associated with uh, many uh, cases of AKI. In fact, the incidence is less than 1% in a study done by Professor Sam Kularatna. So, so, but when you look at so scale viper in other parts of the world, like our neighboring India, especially, we see lots of cases of uh, AKI in these snake bites. So strangely so, it may be that because our a snake is a, if of a different type or maybe they are having a different type of venom. So, so, so therefore, in the context of AKI following snake bites in Sri Lanka, we don't really consider so scale vipers it, it's exclusively Russell's and uh, hump nose pit vipers. So, so therefore, my discussion entirely is confined to these two snakes. And, uh, and if you look at the uh, description of these two snakes, uh, the Russell's viper uh, is uh, you know, prevalent throughout the island. You see, you can find the viper anywhere in the country uh, up to around 1,500 meters of elevation. Um, but it's particularly common in the dry zone, and uh, and its habitat is, dry, is is commonly the dry zone forests and the paddy fields, and the the bite generally occurs at dawn or at dusk, uh, but sometimes during the harvesting season you can get daytime bites, especially at the paddy fields. And uh, the local complications are similar to any other snake bite: pain and swelling. And, and it causes a severe coagulopathy, which is the hallmark of its envenomation. Uh, neurotoxicity can be present. Specifically, it can cause uh, 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 eye-related neurological manifestations, ophthalmoplegia, ptosis. And, uh, and thrombotic microangiopathy is a, is a new, uh, is newly recognized, increasingly recognized manifestation of uh, snake bites which is present in, in following, which can be present in, in uh, Russell's fiber bites, which we'll, we will discuss more in the slides to come. In comparison, hump nose pit viper is again a widely distributed snake, but not found in Jaffna. And, uh, and commonly seen in uh, tea rubber and uh, 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 coconut estates. Sorry, there's a mistake in, in typing. And, uh, Again, the bites occur in the evenings, but they are more commonly uh, uh, prevalent closer to human habitats, and you can get their bites uh, in, the ho in, the, in a garden as well. And, uh, and commonly, it causes local complications, such as uh, pain and swelling, but sometimes can lead to um, uh, gangrene, necrosis, and blistering of the bitten part. Uh, compared to Russell's viper, hump nose pit viper causes a mild amount, degree of coagulopathy. And I would explain why that happens. And neurotoxicity is classically absent following hump nose pit viper. And again, thrombotic microangiopathy can be found in hump nose pit viper bites. Moving on to the pathophysiology, uh, I must say that we are still not certain why AKI occurs following snake bites. It's still uh, as, uh, it's, it's, uh, being evaluated. There are many mechanisms which have been postulated. And, uh, and as you know, snake venom is cons uh, is, um, has a lot of uh, proteins, especially the toxic enzymes. Some of them are phospholipase A2, snake venom metalloproteases and snake venom serine proteases and there are a few more. So these venoms can cause uh, AKI through many mechanisms. One is uh, through development of hypotension and acute tubular necrosis and, and you know uh, that snake bites can cause bleeding, it can lead to systemic plasma leakage hypersensitivity, cardiotoxicity, natriuresis, and sepsis. So these are the mechanisms by which it can cause hypotension and leading to acute tubular necrosis and AKI. Then some snakes can cause rhabdomyolysis and hemolysis, and they can lead to hemoglobinuria and myoglobinuria, leading to uh, nephrotoxicity. And some venoms are associated with direct 
nephrotoxicity as well. Then sometimes venom can lead to acute interstitial nephritis. Sometimes you can get immune deposits in the glomeruli leading to glomerular nephritis. These are rare manifestations. And more and more we are seeing this entity called thrombotic microangiopathy, which presumed to be due to endothelial injury following snake bites. So these are some of the proposed mechanisms of AKI in snake bites. And, um, and when you look at AKI, it's been increasingly recognized that venom-induced consumption coagulopathy is closely linked to AKI. In other words, in most of the patients with AKI following snake bites, you get a preceding venom-induced consumption coagulopathy. So what is venom-induced consumption coagulopathy? It's, uh, as you know, that venoms ha have, certain venoms have procoagulant uh, substances as well as anticoagulant substance, but commonly it's the procoagulant substance. So what happens is these procoagulant substances can activate the clotting cascade at different points. For example, Russell's uh, wiper venom activates factor 10 and factor 5 and leads to activation of the clotting cascade. And uh, hypnale species have a thrombin-like enzyme activity activating fibrinogen into uh, uh, transferring fibrinogen to fibrin and causing um, clotting. So what happens is when they activate the clotting cascade, it, it, it leads to consumption of these clotting factors and lead to clotting factor deficiency leading to bleeding. So it's, it's, it's excessive consumption that leads to bleeding. So why Russell's viper has a potent anticoagulant, sorry, a procoagulant uh, bleeding tendency is because it activates uh, the clotting cascade at a proximal level, so wider consumption of clotting factors compared to um, hump nose viper, which acts at a distal level of the later level of the clotting cascade. So the key thing to remember is in most people who develop AKI following snake bites, they have a preceding venom-induced consumption coagulopathy. Then another association we have found is that increasingly we have seen that people who develop AKI following snake bites, they have thrombotic microangiopathy. And, and this is uh, an entity which has been seen in other diseases like thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and similarly here you get fragmented red cells and thrombocytopenia. And um, and when you look at snakes which cause AKI, snakes which are associated with AKI worldwide, most of them have been associated with thrombotic microns. So I have I've listed some of the snakes. So Russell's wipe and hump nose pit wiper, the two snakes associated with AKI in Sri Lanka, both are associated with thrombotic microangiopathy. And then there are other snakes which are associated with AKI elsewhere in the world. Mostly they are wipers. But there are some elapids uh, which are specifically in uh, Australasian countries. Uh, they can also cause AKI and they are also associated with thrombotic microangiopathy. Third thing is, so I told you that venom in this consumption coagulopathy is associated with AKI and similarly thrombotic microangiopathy is also associated with AKI. And then we look at people with venom induced consumption coagulopathy, the people with AKI are the ones who has also thrombotic microangiopathy. So, so this is another slide coming from uh, Australian um, uh, snake bite project where, that, where, where they looked at all cases of uh, AKI following snake bites in Australia. And they looked at the uh, percentage of schistocytes, which are the fragmented red cells. And then they looked at various groups, the non-venomed, uh, envenomed with uh, no venom-induced consumption coagulopathy, then partial venom-induced consumption coagulopathy with no AKI, then complete venom-induced consumption coagulopathy with no AKI, and then venom-induced consumption coagulopathy with AKI. You see an uh, increase in the proportion of fragmented red cells as you move towards the right. So it clearly says that not all venom-induced consumption coagulopathy patients develop AKI. It's the ones which develop the fragmented red cells that go into develop AKI. So, so clearly there is a close association with these things. Then the next important thing is uh, that the people who had thrombotic microangiopathy tend to develop severe AKI. So these are not just simple creatinine rises of one, you know, 0.1 or 2. 
these are patients who developed uh, severe enough AKI to cause need dialysis. So if you look at the studies, these are some of the studies that have been conducted in people with snake bite associated thrombotic macroangiopathy throughout the world. And at the top, you see our study, which we have done um, a few years back at National Hospital of Sri Lanka, where we looked at all AKI patients coming with um, uh, needing dialysis uh, to following snake bites to this hospital. And, and when we looked at their prevalence of thrombotic microangiopathy, we found all of them had thrombotic microangiopathy. So in other words, there's a high proportion of people who develop thrombotic microangiopathy following snake bites, they need dialysis. So they, need, they develop severe AKI. So this, the other areas of the world, it's the same. So, uh, and in another observational study we conducted it Hor at Horana, where we looked at incident cases of snake um, um, bite patients following hump nose pit piper bites. We found three patients who developed thrombotic microangiopathy out of 100 cases, and uh, all these three needed dialysis. So, so that means thrombotic microangiopathy in snake bites is, is a, is, 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 is a severe indicator of severe disease and it indicates that the need for dialysis. And presence of thrombotic microangiopathy following snake bites associated with worse outcomes. So in, in other words, if they develop AKI, they need longer duration of dialysis, a higher number of dialysis sessions, longer hospital stay, However, this is, uh, these are the data from various studies done on patients with thrombotic microangiopathy following snake bites. You see majority of them survive. There are no deaths or few deaths. And, um, and most achieve dialysis-free survival, but some end up with chronic kidney disease. And uh, the important, another aspect I wanted to highlight in my presentation was to differentiate these various entities in snake bites, um, in patients following snake bites. So we have this venom-induced consumption coagulopathy, then there's another entity called disseminated intravascular coagulation, and then you have this thrombotic microangiopathy. So, so these are very similar, but when you need to clinically be able to differentiate these three sit situations following snake bites. And as I told you, venom induced consumption coagulopathy is there's consumption of clotting factors, you get bleeding, um, and then you, but you don't get thrombi, microthrombi formation, like in thrombotic microangiopathy or DIC. Thrombocytopenia is common to all three, but more profound with DIC and thrombotic microangiopathy. And microangiopathy hemolytic anemia, where you get fragmented red cells, are not seen in venom induced consumption coagulopathy, but seen in DIC and TMA. And coagulation abnormalities are seen with WIC and DIC, but when the TMA stage occurs, that's when you get the fragmented cells and the thrombocytopenia in TMA, uh, classically the coagulation parameters are normal. So that's an important thing that you need to remember. The onset in WIC is very quick, within few minutes to hours, the uh, consumption coagulopathy starts and usually, uh, you know, resolves within 24 to 48 hours. Whereas classically, the thrombotic microangiopathy onset is around 48 to 72 hours, where you see the drop in platelets and the fragmentation of red cells, and then, and, the, and it can extend for many days. Whereas DIC is totally different, where you can have it at any time uh, and even late and it again can be prolonged. So it's important to differentiate these three uh, states in a patient following a snake bite. So moving on to the management. So management includes prevention of AKI as well as treatment of established AKI. So prevention of AKI means the general things that you need to do following a snake bite. So you need to apply first aid, you need to immobilize the limb, and get the patient quickly to the hospital, and then do a rapid clinical assessment. And ne if needed, you need to resuscitate the patient. And then you need to assess for features of envenoming. And then you need to diagnose the snake species. And then if, if, if indicated, you need to administer antivenom. So one of the key things in um, um, treatment or prevention of AKI 
is to identify the snake which can cause AKI. So mostly if, you, if the person or the patient brings the snake, it's easy to identify it as a Russell swipe or a hump nose swiper where we know you can get AKI so you can take necessary precautions. But if, in, the, in case if the patient does not bring the snake, then there are various ways that you can identify a potentially nephrotoxic snake. Uh, and this, these are some of the algorithms. This one algorithm developed by uh, the local team in 2009 published. Um, uh, and, and you see that uh, if, if, so basically the, basically what we need to do here is to identify a Russell swiper. So basically if the snake develops coagulopathy and does have some neurotoxic features and AKI, then you have to think of Russell swiper. And if that particular snake does develop acute renal failure but no neurotoxic features, then you have to think of hump nose with pit viper. So, so this is how they have basically included the AKI part in this uh, algorithm. Um, when it comes to treatment, um, again, as I told you, um, hypotension is one of the key um, uh, uh, precedences leading to AKI. So you need to resuscitate with fluids and if the pressure is still low, you might have to give vasopressors. And the key thing is to administer antivenom. That is the only, only treatment that we can uh, provide specifically to prevent further effects of the venom. And as for that matter, we have only um, antivenom for Russell's viper, which can cause, a, prevent, you know, by giving, you can prevent AKI, but for hump nose viper, we have no um, antivenom yet. So that is a problem. Um, and when you are administering fluids, it's important to understand that the stage of the AKI, because sometimes it, this, the AKI may be fluid responsive in a pre-renal kind of a stage where you have to give fluids, but if the patient has already going, gone into acute tubular necrosis, then you have to hold the fluids because it might end up with fluid overload. And the other important thing is to avoid other nephrotoxic substances, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which, which are commonly used for pain, killer, pain relief. Renal replacement therapy, if needed, is standard as for any other AKI. So it could be hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or if the patient is so unstable, you might have to consider continuous renal replacement therapy. And the specific management of AKI involves uh, special situations. Like for example, if somebody develops uh, rhabdomyolysis or intravascular hemolysis, you might have to aggressively hydrate the patient. Um, and also may need consider alkalinization of urine. And uh, especially when, when it comes to hump nose pit pipe bites, uh, this constant question comes to our mind, what can we do to prevent AKI? Because Russell's viper, you have an antivenom, so you can just give it. But um, so people have suggested various, various ways of preventing. One is to use f fresh frozen plasma in venom-induced consumption coagulopathy because we know it's closely linked with AKI. <coughs> Sorry. So whether we could give FFP and reverse venom-induced consumption coagulopathy, whether that could lead to prevention of AKI. So there are some studies which have been done, but, but what they have shown is that FFP, by giving FFP, you can reverse the coagulopathy most of the time, but it has not translated into uh, hard outcomes like prevention of AKI or death. So as of now, we don't advocate giving FFP for people with WIC uh, just to as a preventative measure for AKI. But, but if somebody has bleeding, yes, clearly you have to correct the bleeding with um, FFP. On the other hand, um, people thought of doing, if somebody develops thrombotic microangiopathy, whether it's, there's a place for therapeutic plasma exchange and no FFP. Again, therapeutic plasma exchange has been used in other situations where you get thrombotic microangiopathy, such as in TTP, and it has been shown to be effective in um, uh, treating AKI or preventing AKI. But, <coughs> but in snake bites, unfortunately, it has not shown so far there's any benefit. These are some of the studies which have been conducted and uh, uh, this one on the top is our study, and as of now, we have not found that there is a benefit of uh, giving therapeutic plasma exchange. Whether there's uh, whether it it it, ha it has not caused any 
added benefit in reducing death or uh, reducing requirement for dialysis or needing to reduce the re duration of dialysis or dialysis free survival so so we need further data before we can advocate this type of treatment for these patients so with that i will try to conclude my presentation and and you can have the latest information on snake bites guidelines on management on um, at the slma uh, snake bite um, expert committee um, uh, site so it clearly gives you the latest information and there is an update coming very soon so uh, the latest update so 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 you need to keep on um, visiting this place because this because it, the 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 management guidelines keep on changing so so that's the important thing that you need to remember thank you thank you ranga uh, we'll move on quickly to the questions uh, based on venom city is is what is the difference between different types of hump nose wipers is the difference between the venom venomations uh, yeah, so, uh, um yeah so basically um, i'm i'm not an expert i must say i'm not an expert on snake bites or envenomations i'm just an uh, dumb some work on ak but i would like to answer that question now uh, you have three species of hump nose uh, pit wipers uh, which was um, uh, the first one was the hypnali hypnali which is the most widespread uh, at, uh, species uh, and subsequently especially kalana uh, maduage is the one who just uh, you know revised the nomenclature of hump nose pit wipers and uh, uh, we added these two other species hypnale nipa and hypnale zara those are the two other species um, according to the current evidence what we have seen there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in the venom composition or the potency between these three species however because uh, because the human contact is more with hypnale hypnale we see more cases with hypnale hypnale whereas hypnale nepa and zara the human contact is much less because they are confined to certain parts of the country and certain areas so so therefore we might not be seeing uh, the you know um, the you know manifestations of their envenomations but but at the moment the general acceptance is there's no difference between the composition of the venoms between the three species thank you no so they want like to know where this uh, uh, reference to the this new classification you're talking on the end Uh, categorization of poisonous snakes uh, yeah it is available at the sri lanka medical association this particular website okay right thank right. you and uh, is that when we talking about the prevention is practicing strict immunization is something that you need practice after a, a snake bite uh, i don't know whether you can answer that or um well again as i told you i am i'm not an expert but yeah. these are some of the things that we generally advocate because you if you i mean general common sense is that you know if somebody tries to you know mobilize and you know exert then you kind of uh, you 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 are try to expend your energy and then it increases your blood flow and all things like that so i don't know whether that is the basis for immobilization but but i i think it's a general thing that we generally advocate but but i am not very sure with there's any evidence for this so hmm. if there's uh, any other basis uh what are the are there any markers of particular say people who get aki whether they will go into a ckd after when in minimum um yeah so again this is an area where not much data is available um um because primarily because it's a tropical disease and 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 nobody is you know you know when it comes to uh, high income countries you know funders they're not interested in this type of this so that is why it's become a neglected tropical disease so um, so unfortunately we don't have much data on this um, so at the moment we are more focused on finding who are the people who are likely to get aki and whether we can diagnose aki early with any markers and trying to prevent aki and manage aki at that stage uh, so we have done some work on uh, finding bio biomarkers on um, uh, diagnosing people now for example hump nose pit viper majority of them will not develop aki 
So it would be useful to find out which category of patients will develop, go on to develop PK so they can catch them early and institute various treatment modalities including hydration and things like that. So we have done some work on that and there are some markers including um, um, uh, serum cystatine C has been shown uh, in our studies to be an early mark of uh, uh, developing AKI. So, but these are you know small studies, so it needs to be they need to be validated. But as for that question, whether we can find out who are going to end up with CKD, uh, that of course uh, no studies have been done. So, what is the the take home message is that if somebody develops AKI following a snake bite, it's important to follow them up. You cannot uh, lose them. They have to come for follow-ups and we have to just monitor them in the long term to see whether they develop CKD. That is the only thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, another interesting question from Dr. Raghunathan. He wants to ask Dr. Kumaran. Uh, in his experience as children was that uh, Kumbari Mukan, the hump nose wiper was seen in Jaffna at that time. You want to say whether things have changed or because uh, I think the statement saying that it's not found in Jaffna. Anything that you can add on that uh, hump nose wiper, is it seen in Jaffna at the moment? Or? We have not encountered any hump nose wipers for the last five years. Okay, right. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, so, I think with the time coming, catching up, thank you very much, Ranga, for that excellent presentation. We will move on to the next talk. Thank you. Uh, we are moving to the last uh, lecture of the specialty update of tropical medicine. Uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Sam Kulratna from Peradeniya joining virtually with this uh, specialty update. Professor Sam Kulratna is a professor and senior lecturer in medicine, faculty of medicine Peradeniya. And he has a special interest in research on snake bite, stings, tropical infections such as rickettsial infections. Dengue and leptospirosis. He pioneered publishing emerging rickettsial infections in Central Hills, particularly spotted fever. So, may I invite uh, Prof. Sam Kulratna for his talk on stings and bites other than snakes. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, anyway, first of all, let me thank the organizers of this. Uh, meeting and extend this invitation, I think uh, is a good topic, actually, the tropical medicine. Also, I would consider actually topic given to me also very interesting because uh, the stings and bites other than uh, snakes uh, is an environmental problem. Hope you all can hear me. Uh, it's an environmental problem. So there are macrobites as well as microbites. If you hear the dogs, dog bites, monkey bites, and so on. But I'm not going to talk about the, this kind of bites, but I'm going to talk about the, the microbites, that means the micro environment, the, uh, the microscopic environment, the small features environment. So environmental medicine is very interesting because we live in the environment, right? So to understand what's the burden of these uh, stings and bites other than snakes, I'll show you some data uh, we have collected uh, long ago, not long ago, somewhere around 2010, uh, 2013, yes. This is a study done in North Central Province in primary hospital over one year. And other than snake bite, there were 623 uh, stings and bites in this uh, district, Tornagel district, in 44 primary hospitals. Because these... Uh, kind of bites uh, and stings won't come to major hospitals. So this study concentrated mainly in the small hospital. Of them, hymenoptera, I'll come to that later, hymenoptera means wasps, bees, and so on, that come to about bigger number. They are flying snakes, 357 centipedes. I'm sure you would have seen enough centipedes, uh, centipedes in the environment, 99. In the plant, uh, spider, 61. In the scorpion, 40. So understand that uh, these uh, stings and bites are not uncommon. Uh, so it is good to know uh, about uh, something about these stings and bites. Uh, those are of medical relevance. 
So, I mean, first of all, I'll pose a question to the audience, right, and the viewers. Uh, here I'm showing a flying insect. I would like you to identify this insect. From my practice, I have seen that uh, doctors, uh, when there is an uh, insect bite, always try to wasp bite. Try wasp bite. Anything is a wasp bite. So, at least we should try to change that practice and try to have some idea about the identification of this, uh, these uh, insects because uh, it's medically important. So I have given the possible uh, answers here. Could it be Asian honeybee? The usual honeybee, we, uh, we take honey, bee honey. So it's called bee massa. Then the other one is a giant Asian rock honeybee. That's the bamara. So everybody know about the bamara, right? Going to Sigiria and those places. Then there's another one called feral dwarf honeybee. Dunduel Mimasa, those who have actually wandering in the in the, the bushes and the jungle would have seen this uh, Dunduel Mimasa's uh, colonies. And the stingless bees, Kanea Mimasa, I mean, that is, you see, at your dwellings, uh, they make uh, some kind of, uh, uh, not a colony really, some kind of uh, 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 structure, and they won't actually uh, do the stinging. And the other one is uh, Hornet, or Debra, one of the vicious fellow. Oh, there's uh, Kalandurua. This Kalandurua is also uh, kind of similar to Debra, uh, clo uh, live close to the house. And uh, the stinging, the vicious fellow, the stinging is very painful. So what do you think about this uh, insect? If somebody can identify, I'm happy. But because of the time fact, I won't uh, wait. I'll proceed. Uh, then uh, you will come to know what I'm, uh, I'm describing now. So coming to this uh, Hymenoptera, they are the, uh, they're, it's, a, it's a big uh, family uh, or class it's called order that, that includes ants, wasps, and bees. I mean, they are popular, uh, their actually numbers are much bigger than the humans, right? So they are all over the world. There are two families, Vespidae and Epidae. There are two families, Vespidae and Epidae. Under Vespidae, there are social wasp, large numbers of 860 species. Then the subfamily Vespinae that has wasp, the hornets, and the yellow jackets, right? Wasp, hornets, and yellow jackets in eating all hours, but there are some morphological different, bit, difference between the wasp, hornets, and yellow jackets. The hornet in Sri Lanka, what you call Debra is called Vespa affinis. Uh, so this Debra is really not a true wasp, it is a hornet. It is called Vespa affinis. Then coming to family Epidae, the Bamara, or giant in honeybee, is the one I'm referring. That is called uh, Epis dosata. So this is actually the first picture I showed you. Now you will uh, got to know the answer. There is a hornet, O Debra, O Vespa affinis, one of the vicious uh, flying insect. And this is what their nest you see. This picture I took from the pediatric department of the medical faculty. It was lying and coexisting with the students and the staff. And the danger is, uh, the, apart from anaphylaxis, that's a very common manifestation of the eye stinging, there are organ dysfunction. So this unfortunate event of the husband and wife dying due to acute pulmonary edema and acute renal failure after massive uh, hornet stinging in Sri Lanka. So these pictures show there's a damage to uh, the kidneys as well as lung is studded with uh, pulmonary edema. Then some, another interesting uh, syndrome they uh, cause is what is called Coney syndrome. Coney syndrome. That is a, the vasospastic, coronary vasospasm producing acute myocardial uh, ischemia, or sometimes ending with uh, my, uh, myocardial infarction. So uh, that's a, that's this Coney syndrome is not confined to this particular insect, but it's a widely recognized problem now, vasospastic coronary uh, syndromes. Then coming to Pamara, Oh, giant in honeybee, uh, everybody familiar with this. Uh, if you look at the bodily structure, the bamara is somewhat smaller than the 
hornet and the color pattern also different. And they make uh, this type of comb. So this picture I took from uh, Anuradhapura Hospital, Prof. Unit Toflo, uh, when the unit was coming up. So this, uh, these are the rock, this is a rock face in a temple, right? Uh, temple cave. There's a rock face. You see the, the colony of this uh, Bamara. So when they are actually disturbed, they attack. So in this particular paper, the, what we publish, this stinging cause, uh, caused myocardial infarction, bowel gangrene, and pet anaphylaxis. So there are a few differences in these two uh, uh, flying insects I'll show you later. And uh, for comparison, now we can get your mental picture of these two insects. And uh, they're actually stinging, they're not biters. So where they are sting, you might think their sting is in the in the mouth or whether in the in the bottom part, right? So you need to know where it is. Their sting is actually situated at the bottom part here, right? At the, uh, this place. So that is, uh, I mean, these uh, stingers are really a female species. Uh, I mean, these female species won't reproduce, so they have their uh, reproductive. Uh, organ that is the, 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 that is called ovipositor. So this ovipositor is a sting, so modified as a, sting, a stinger. So that has a venom sac as well as the ovipositor is a, the, the stinger. When the, the hornet stings, the, it takes the ovipositor back. So you see only the, uh, only the uh, stinging mark, but the, when the bamara stings, it remains in the skin. So that's, by that we can differentiate whether it's a hornet or the uh, stinging or bamara stinging. So it is important in case of uh, the, the bamara or giant in hybrid stinging, we need to remove those things quickly, gently. If you do that uh, with a vigorous manner, again, the more venom will be delivered to the body. It should be removed gently. Then later on, we described another uh, species that's called carpenter bee. This particular case, actually, I came across from the newspaper and we did the investigation. And that was for the first time we published this uh, carpenter bee. It could be a killer. And you see, it also has this stinger, right? There's a modified st uh, stinger. It's quite lengthy, very painful, I suppose. So when you come to management of this, uh, uh, Stinging manifestations in the I mean, the important the management of anaphylaxis. So I'm not going to talk about uh, management of anaphylaxis. That is the, the, the bread, and, bread and butter of our medical practice day to day. Then, as I said, the cardiac complication and the multi-organ dysfunctions, these should be anticipated and managed. Then I changed my topic. This is another story where history of discovery of Indian red scorpion in the northern Sri Lanka. I understand Dr. Professor Kumanan uh, is in the audience, right? So he would agree with me. So physicians found uh, deaths caused by what is called white scorpion in Jaffna, right? Uh, that was a time actually the Jaffna was not accessible. So I got the uh, details from my uh, Jaffna colleagues. Uh, in 2003, there were about 12 deaths. And then annually, there were one death due to this uh, a scorpion stinging, uh, st a scorpion sting, the white scorpion. People call it white scorpion. Um, uh, later on, we actually started uh, uh, doing a research on it to identify what is this white scorpion. So in Peradenia, we, uh, I was able to get down some uh, scorpions from Jaffna and uh, Professor uh, uh, from the with a collaboration from government zoology professor Ranavaka, Ranavana, he was able to send some samples to the uh, Czech Republic and there's expert. So with that, actually, this was identified as potentate or tamulus or Indian red scorpion. So the Indian red scorpion is found in Sri Lanka that was not existed, that did not exist earlier. So. This is the scorpion, it's really a red scorpion. Though people call it a, a white scorpion, but it's a red scorpion, it's an Indian red scorpion. Why it has become white? Because in comparison to the very commonly seen, 
a black scorpion. There's a, a black scorpion, a giant frost scorpion we see in and around our houses in a rainy day, right? This is not a killer, but this Indian red scorpion is a killer. So the, coming to the scorpions in Sri Lanka, there are 16 species so far identified. And from this Indian red scorpion, we really did the, their clinical manifestations. These are the clinical manifestations, tachycardia, bradycardia, hypertension, hyperthermia, pulmonary edema, diaphoresis, pile erection, hypertension, salivation, lacrimination, incontinence, then the local manifestation. I mean, this is what is called uh, autonomic storming. So patient get both activation of sympathetic as well as parasympathetic, finally leading, uh, leading to acute heart failure and pulmonary edema, that is the cause of death. This is happening in India very often. Locally, of course, uh, the, the bitten part is very painful, right? So all these uh, stinging parts are shown in this picture. The management, in fact, uh, I have to congratulate, congratulate my Jaffna colleagues. They started using prosocene to counter the, uh, uh, counter the uh, autonomic storm. With that, the deaths came down. Now nobody died due to scorpion stinging. Uh, if I am correct, uh, Professor Kuman will answer. But for the local thing, uh, the lignocaine application is necessary. But in India, they have developed antivenom for it. But we don't have this antivenom and we are not importing either. So leaving scorpions, then the spiders. So people are very scared of spiders because spiders are found uh, everywhere, inside the houses, inside the, outside the garden, and everywhere you find the spiders. So spiders are very rich in the world. You can see the number of species, 43,000 plus species, 200 of them are dangerous. Countries like Australia, South Africa, uh, South America, they are having the killer uh, spiders. We, in Sri Lanka, we have 502 species. Of them, the, the, the 22 tarantulas. So spiders, there are subcategory called tarantulas. But fortunately, people are very scared about this tarantula, so divimakulua, right, divimakulua, but uh, divimakulua bites, they bite of course, they have mouth, mouth parts and they have the venom in their, uh, around the mouth. So their bites can uh, produce envenoming, but fortunately uh, there are no deaths happening in Sri Lanka. They get some kind of, the, the victims get severe pain, sometimes some allergic or anaphylactic reactions. Leaving the spiders, then I'll come to uh, jellyfish uh, because jelly, jellyfish stinging is quite common in Australia. They also they are expert. Uh, uh, they are very, they have expertise about jellyfish stinging in Australia. But later on, our colleagues in Jaffna they started studying jellyfish stinging around the Jaffna area. So these pictures actually I got from uh, my Jaffna colleagues, and. Uh, you see that jellyfish touch has produced some kind of uh, the reaction there, I mean, the very painful reaction. So again, the management is anaphylaxis. So I don't, I, I, I do not intend to talk much, but uh, uh, giving some idea or sharing something about the these bites and stings other than snakes, uh, to know about the environmental hazards, uh, what are the challenges? The reduction of reduction of mortality. So unknown numbers of people are victims are die, dying due to these things, especially owner stinging, people are dying. They are not accounted for, but they are happening. So that those should be reduced. The prevention, of course, the is very difficult because this environmental uh, uh, problem. But the uh, educating the public to avoid and not to disturb these environmental creatures is very important. So education would be the best fitted for the prevention. Another thing is some, some people are very sensitive to uh, any stinging or bites. They get uh, immediate anaphylactic reactions. So only answer is to keep those type of people uh, some re ready-made adrenaline mini jabs. But these mini jabs are not available in Sri Lanka, if at all very expensive. Uh, once I bought a mini jab for my use, it cost about 6,000 rupees. So they're not available. More than anything, it's a conservation. So we, we should learn the art of to live with these creatures. Thank you very much for your patience listening.
Thank you, Professor Kularatna, uh, taking us through that very interesting topic, which we may not be thinking too much about, as you said, may be presenting to peripheral hospitals than the major hospitals. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir, Ranga. Hello, sir. This is Eranga here. So yeah, I have two two questions from you, sir. One is that it's very interesting your talk, and especially I just want to uh, translate into a uh, snake bites as well. Now you said about Cooney syndrome, and uh, the, where you get this coronary artery spasm following uh, uh, various venom in, in injections. And uh, does it happen with uh, snake bites as well? Uh, have you seen any such uh, cases? Because we know that antivenom can cause Cooney syndrome uh, as a reaction. The second question is uh, regarding anaphylaxis. Now you said various these uh, insect bites can, one of the main reasons they get clinical manifestations is anaphylaxis and hypersensitive reactions. Now, similar thing you did you experience with snake venom as well? Because we see sometimes people come with cardiovascular collapse following snake bites, and it, it, we cannot explain the exact pathophysiology uh, behind this. Because there is no coagulopathy, there is no bleeding, but they come with collapse. And uh, so, just want to know your views on this. Thank you, Rang. Actually, two, two interesting question to answer. The first question is Cooney syndrome. I have seen after snake bite, they are developing myocardial infarctions, right? Uh, or oh, uh, some uh, changes in the ECG. I'm sure the, later on they have recovered and uh, investigated with coronary angios and had normal uh, coronaries. So uh, not very much. Uh, there are a few publications I can remember about the uh, myocardial infarctions after snake bite. So must be coming under this category, coronary vasos spasms. So that is the answer to that. Then the second question is venom-induced anaphylaxis. Yes, it's happening. The venom is a foreign uh, material protein. Theoretically, when it's given to somebody's body, the patients, people can react immediately with anaphylactic uh, manifestations. So this immediate cardiovascular collapse must be due to anaphylaxis. Uh, not uh, very difficult to prove these things, but we have to by our knowledge, we should apply that principle. So, uh, so manage. Uh, so, the question is, should we immediately manage these patients with adrenaline and so on after snake bite and collapse? I think so. I think so. There are one situations. One patient, you one of my colleagues, uh, who had a patient with Russell's five bite patient had a, a severe bronchospasms immediately after that, and he had to nebulize the patient with adrenaline uh, nebulizer. So it worked. Thank you, Rangu. Thank you, sir. Uh, two questions on from the virtual audience regarding the therapeutics. Any place for PASMEX? One is whether there's any place, any place for PASMEX exchange in stingings with systemic manifestations. Other one is what's the dose of processing that you can start on the people with the scopian bites, red scopian bites? Any, uh... yeah, I mean, the plasma exchange, no studies. I would say there are no studies about the plasma exchange because the, the, the here, not much of a coagulation disorders happening with uh, this kind of stingings. Then coming to the processing doses, actually my Jaffna colleagues, they know better what the dose they use. It is not the, the smaller dose. They usually start at a higher dose. That's what I understand. Any? The something uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Prof. Eranga asked about the, the Cooney syndrome, uh, I think it's mainly reported with the Russell's viper bites, uh, the Cooney's, but we had one case of Cobra bite who had admitted to the ETU, collapsed and had an anterior ST elevation, then uh, managed and then he had a coronary angiogram, it was normal. So this uh, one of the uh, it's it's seen, but I can probably it's under recognized. Uh, the Cooney syndrome can happen even with the, the snake bites. Thank you, Dilsha. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. In absence of any further questions, thank you very much, Professor Kularatna, for joining us through Zoom and making this uh, uh, presented the the 
symposium a very successful one so i would like to okay. thank all four speakers for their time in preparation and um, presenting the, their data and their speeches i think that has enriched the 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 silon college physicians uh, the specialty update for this month and we have certificate of present, uh, participation in appreciation of your contribution uh, uh, since we have dr iranga here we will hand it over to you personally and other ones will be handing over separately uh, we'll send it across to all the speakers uh, professor iranga would you like to join to the podium to accept your certificate Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had a very successful session on tropical medicine. So again, uh, from the Ceylon College of Physicians and Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, we would like to thank all of you, the speakers, and all of you who have joined us physically and virtually. So we hope we'll be meeting with you with another specialty update in next month. Thank you. Thank you very much.